Let me briefly summarize things which I said in the last two weeks. In my first lecture, I reminded you that Bible and subject is a subject not to be ignored. If we ignore, we ignore it at our peril. Exactly the way a person suffering from a very chronic illness puts himself to danger if he ignores his physician or surgeon. The difference being that if you ignore a medical instruction, you put your physical life to peril. Whereas if you ignore things related to spiritual life such as the reliability of the Christian faith and reliability of the Bible, you are putting your eternity into peril. You may ask, how is that possible? Because uh, once a person is saved, how is it possible for his eternity to be in peril? Even if he's a person is saved, if he develops doubts, and that is very common for people to develop doubts, he or she may become a backslider in the spiritual life. That happened to me. When I was a ninth standard student, I had accepted Christ when I was in the first standard. It's my dad who shared the gospel with me. And uh, very clearly I remember the day I remember the message he shared with me. I was slightly above average, so in the first standard, and also I came to the first standard only when I was in the sixth, when I was six years old. He shared the gospel. Yes, I said, Dad, I am a sinner. I need to accept Christ there itself. I knelt down with my father and accepted Christ as my personal savior. But when I was in the ninth standard, I started having serious doubts about the Bible. And had God not placed a book in my hand using his providence today I would not have been a Christian I most probably would have been a revolutionary and that also not an ordinary revolutionary I would have been a revolutionary with a gun that's the kind of temperament and attitude with which I was born and right from the beginning I have been uh, that kind of a person in my thinking and on top of that, when I was a school student, I was a member of uh, SFI, the communist wing, and I, I used to be one of the most fiery preachers. But then, I started having questions. If the Bible is reliable, then are you doing it right? If it is not reliable, then are you right what you believe is that right in god's providence a brother placed henry m morris's book bible and modern science into my hands that was a turning point and as i told you last week it took me 14 years of study to overcome all my doubts and that was the time when i devoted myself to speak on this subject bible and sci science is actually not an isolated subject it is part of a broader subject in theology known as apologetics. Apologetics deals with the logical foundations of the Christian faith. It examines the logical foundations and it also explains the logical foundations. It defends Bible and the Christian faith when questions are raised against the Bible. So we ignore the question of faith, reason, Bible and science at our peril and therefore if there is anyone here who has been in the habit of ignoring the problem, I would urge you, especially parents, please don't ignore. If your children ask questions, give them answers. If you don't have answers, read. If that's difficult for you or if you are not able to grasp, place this literature in their hands. If literature is not available, let me remind you, there are many who have devoted their life to speak on Bible and science. Take them to this kind of meetings buy videos a video worth 500 rupees would be the would be the I, I would say the cheapest investment that you made for eternity then last sunday i reminded you that though they bring a lot of objection against the bible in the name of science no established fact of science has ever discredited the bible and i also reminded you that no statement of the bible has ever questioned an established fact of science here, 
the key to my statement is established fact of science. See, depending upon the branch of science, as much as 90% of information floating in the world of that science might be theory. A good example is my field. I have worked in the cutting edge field of what is known as quantum nuclear physics. I worked not only in quantum nuclear physics, my work was on the quark structure of protons and neutrons. And starting from theory, for almost nine years, I worked on the theory. In the ninth year, I finally got the solution. The equation was this long and the solution was four A4 pages. And then we ran that equation through a main, one of the larger computers for a whole year to get a solution. That looks amazing, isn't it? But let me tell you one thing. Not 90%. In fact, 99% of what is reported in journals related to my field, they are only theories. In the best journals, what they report are theories. And therefore, when someone comes and says, oh, science has proved this, hold on, don't panic. And firmly ask that person, is it a, an established fact or are you talking about a theory? Somebody comes and says, hey, quarks have proved that Bible is wrong. Be patient. Don't lose your courage. Ask them whether it is a fact or whether it is a theory or still better, whether it is a model. Because though people have been working on quarks for the last 40 years and though the machines on which they perform experiments, I told you one of them is 30 kilometers in circumference and the latest one is 100 kilometers in circumference just to study those tiny quarks. The existence of quarks, though it is highly accepted, it still has some problems and it is still in theoretical stages. Though a Nobel Prize has been given to those who discovered or those who proposed quarks, no one has isolated quarks so far. And they believe that we would never be able to isolate quarks and therefore all study of quarks depends upon models. It's totally different from the study of protons and neutrons and electrons. So if somebody gets all excited against the Bible and says that this latest discovery has disproved the Bible, first of all, don't panic. Number two, ask whether it is a fact. And number three, persist. And you would find that no established fact of science has contradicted the Bible and you should not be surprised. Since Bible is the word of God, the all-knowing creator, that is exactly what we expect. On the other hand, if the Bible is full of errors, then one should really suspect whether Bible is the word of God. So keep that as your most powerful weapon in your arsenal. Is it an established fact of science? Now you may say, yes, okay, I agree. But then there are many questions which are unresolved, right? Bible and science is not a topic which can be covered in two or three hours. I teach this subject, the subject of the reliability of the Christian faith in the seminary. I usually teach two hours a day and the classes go on for four years. And still we don't come to an end of my subject and that is apologetics. It is such a vast subject. In fact, there are professional societies devoted to apologetics. I'll show you some of the journals. I couldn't bring all, but randomly I picked up some. And even in the field of apologetics, there is so much super specialization that when the latest issue of the journal comes, Probably only one-tenth of it is relevant to your own area of specialization. There is so much work going on. And therefore, if I have not been able to cover everything in three hours, and if you have not 
been able to find an answer to all your questions in three hours, that's because of the enormity of the subject, not because answers do not exist. But then there are one or two problems which might be there in your mind and I would like to mention them and one of them which often comes to me is Joshua's long day. Um, Bible says that three millennia ago Joshua asked the sun to stand still and the sun stood still. Two questions are there. Does it mean that the smooth functioning of the universe was interfered with did God interfere with the smooth working of the universe? Was there an astronomical problem? Number two, do you have a scientific proof for that? I'll start with the second question first. If you ask me, do you have a scientific proof for that? The answer is no, because science deals with experiments, things that can be repeatedly performed in a laboratory, whereas things that have happened in the past and which are reported either in the Bible or in other, any other medium such as a newspaper is history. And therefore, Joshua's long day is, it doesn't come, that problem doesn't come under physics, it doesn't come under chemistry, it's not a part of astronomy, it's basically a part of history. And therefore, if we want to answer that question, has there been a long day like that, instead of looking into physics or chemistry or astronomy or any of the sciences, we must look first into history. Of course, if we can find an answer in physics, fine. If we can find an answer in astronomy, fine. But things that have happened in the past are basically a part of history. So the question, the first question is, do we have any kind of record for such a long day in human history? And the answer is yes. There are tens of thousands of evidences of that past event spread throughout the world just waiting to be discovered. Only thing, often we do not see them because we are not looking for them there. However, in the 20th century, there were a number of, number of men who, as they were studying archaeological data, were surprised at a few things. And then they delved deeply into the archaeological data and to their surprise found out that something very catastrophic did take place approximately 3,000 years ago. It was more like 3,400 years ago. And they kept on investigating and found out that there is evidence in archaeology, there is evidence in history, there is evidence in folklore, and there is evidence in Earth's magnetic imprint in stones. There is evidence everywhere. I hope you noticed from proof I have started using the word evidence because in history, we no longer have proofs. Proof belongs to science and mathematics. In history, what we have is evidence. And based upon evidence, a person reconstructs history and if all the facts or almost all the facts fit the reconstruction, that evidence is accepted to be reliable and we say, well, such and such thing did happen. That is the way they prove something in courts or courts of law. The man who did pioneering work in this field was Immanuel Wilkowski. He was not a Christian. He was not a believer in Bible. He was, in fact, he was almost an atheist. But as he started discovering information after information, fact after fact from history, he started looking in historical records. And finally he came to the book of Joshua and he said, hey, this look like, th looks like it. And then he calculated, corroborated the date and found out that all these things which he had collected, they point to this particular date. What, were, what was the information he collected? He found out that the Egyptians who used to build temples, they always used to build temples according to certain astronomical calculation. 
say if there is a temple it would follow a certain precise direction which using a sextant and other instruments you can find out so all the pyramids that you see they all have a very definite relation with astronomy and to his surprise though all of these pyramids and temples and everything had a direct correlation with astronomical data there was one set of buildings and monuments which were totally different they had absolutely no correlation with the present day astronomy he also found that all of these renegade buildings none of which had any correlation with the later buildings they all showed the same pattern which means at a certain time in human history the earth's axis was oriented in another direction and if that correction were made approximately 20 to 23 degrees all these buildings would once again fall into an astronomical pattern and then whatever we have now they would be out of step and he came to the conclusion that the earth passed through some kind of an upheaval before that earth's axis was oriented in a particular direction and they built these temples and buildings based upon that orientation and after this upheaval the axis changed and now all the buildings that we see today or which are common which tourists go and see they are oriented in the new direction and the date according to calculations pointed to that long day of joshua he also collected folklore myths and other things and he found out that almost every society every culture every religion had folklore which pointed to that long day his book is known as the first book was known known as worlds in chaos then earth in upheaval then ages in chaos amazing reading amazing and surprisingly he was not a christian he was not a creationist he was not even a dedicated theist he was almost an atheist look around there is proof all around only thing most people ignore it those who can use the data those who are qualified to use the data often they ignore because it doesn't fit with their preconceived notions and therefore if you ask me do you have evidence for the long day of joshua oh yes the world of science has thrown up so much data that immanuel velikovsky alone had to write almost 10 volumes some of them were published some of them were not published i am trying to collect all of them so much data just one man could collect then you were, then you might ask okay if that is true does it mean that god interfered with earth's rotation that's a good question the word of god doesn't tell exactly how god did it and since the word of god doesn't tell us exactly how god did it we cannot come to any definite conclusion we can come only to one conclusion that something happened and it was so it was so cataclysmic that even the axis of the earth shifted that day or it caused a shift beginning that day how did god do that we don't know but we can definitely ask another question and that comes in the area of science was it necessary for god to interfere with the rotation of the earth to produce that effect and the answer is no it was not necessary for god to in interfere with the rotation of the earth to produce a long day because an unusually long day longer than daytime longer than 12 hours can be produced by a number of phenomena in fact those who have lived in the north of canada they testify that there the daylight can continue for days or even weeks and at night they have to draw the curtain so that there is some amount of comfortable darkness for them to go to bed and therefore if daylight 
can extend not only for 24 hours but for days together today naturally god could have used any of these natural phenomena then also to produce the long day exactly how did he do it he doesn't explain in his word but one thing is clear to us if he wanted to do that without interfering with the rotation of the earth he could have done so so all the available data today point to the long day of joshua and reminds us that something happened which was unusual and there's a lot of folklore there is a lot of history there is a lot of oral history which tells that that did happen there was a long day all around the earth some of you may then want to ask about another similar incident i hope you remember god extending the life of king ezekiah and god said listen i'll make the shadow proceed 10 degrees or come back 10 degrees as a sign and he said lord the shadow anyway always proceeds forward that's a small thing but it would be an unusual thing if the shadow returns 10 degrees which is equal to approximately 40 minutes and the word of god says that the shadow on the sundial went back 10 degrees and again it was uh, primarily the work of emmanuel velikovsky which pointed out that again there was a, an upheaval of a lesser magnitude but there was an upheaval did was there a long day well that falls that belongs to history and history says yes there was something unusual did the dial of ahaz return did the shadow return history says there was something unusual that is the best that that, that information can do that is the best that science can do and whatever information is available when we look at the best of the information best of the evidence it points out to the veracity the truthfulness of the biblical narrative then you may say okay uh, that answers or per perhaps that partially answers my question but then you as a believer in bible do you believe that god created life or did man come here through a process of evolution i used to be a firm believer in evolution and then i studied what is known as the law of probability that was when i went to bs msc first year and in msc first year that was one of the first things that our professor taught us the law of probability and please remember my professor was not a christian he was a hindu and he was not a theist he was an atheist we had an excellent relation so whenever i would mention god he would turn and say probably not yeah we had an excellent relation and actually it's he who induced me to come into teaching the day i wrote my msc final year exam he called me to his cabin and said johnson all these fellows who wrote the exam with you all of you are going to become university rank holders and immediately after that all of them are going to become clerks in state bank of india he said nothing wrong with that let every person find an occupation but johnson you should get into teaching i did get into teaching immediately after my msc results came i went into teaching i taught in many institutions and all my life i have been a teacher i'm thankful to my professor but i'm much more thankful to him for one thing that man who did not even believe in god he made the law of probability and the mathematics of probability so clear to me that i could use it to apply and examine any probabilistic phenomena including chemicals reacting with each other and i found out that there is no probability for spontaneous evolution of life oh you may say but haven't you heard are you living are you still living in the 16th century haven't you heard of test tube babies they have been creating babies in the laboratories yeah i've been hearing a lot i've been amused a lot also when people come and tell me that they are manufacturing babies in the laboratory they are not doing that all what they are doing is take an ovum take a sperm 
fertilize it in the laboratory, put it back into the womb. When they take a heart from a freshly dead man, put it into another man, transplantation, it's a recombination of things that already exist. They are not creating a new human being. Figuratively, of course, they are creating a new human being. The patient would say, Doctor, I've, not, I, I've never been the same after this surgery. But you are not creating a new life. In the same way, what they label as test tube babies, actually it should be labeled as test tube fertilization because the fertilization itself, the process take, takes place in laboratory glassware. It's not creation of life. But then you may say, well, I heard that somebody, um, probably it was Dr. Hargovin Kurana who got Nobel Prize who created human life in, or at least he created life in laboratory. No. What Hargovin Kurana did was, he developed a method for synthesizing genes. That's all. And even for synthesizing genes, he used pre-existing genetic material. It was not creation starting with hydrogen and carbon and oxygen or whatever is uh, whatever goes into making genes. Even today, synthesizing a brand new gene is an extremely difficult process. It doesn't take place randomly. You may say, but I heard that Somewhere in laboratory, they made hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen or carbon dioxide to pass through a tube and life resulted. It's true that they did perform that kind of an experiment about 30 years ago. That did not result in life. What they did was, they understood the chemical properties and the way chemicals would, or elements would combine, they made a very complex apparatus, they passed electricity, they heated it, and they passed some of these uh, elements and compounds in gaseous form through it. And when they did that, that for anywhere, somewhere between 16 to 24 hours, they got some amino acids. That's all. Oh, you may say, isn't that creation of life? Eh? Well, if somebody from a kiln brings a bunch of bricks and places in your courtyard and if you say, now the tower is ready, I was planning to build a hundred story, hundred story tower and the tower is built, then making of amino acids is equal to creation of life. In fact, what I said is an underestimate. The day the foundation stone is laid, the first stone of a factory, if somebody says that an incredibly complex factory has been built, you would laugh at it. A similar gap exists between amino acids and life. Not only that, in layman's language, let me tell you, the amino acids which go into our cells, they are of one kind, whereas what was formed in laboratory was of a mixed kind and they could not find any method to randomly separate them. First of all, this was not a random experiment, this was a planned experiment. And even the planned experiment gave them a combination which could not be separated randomly. And therefore, if anyone comes and says, hey, they created life, no, they did not create life. They created some amino acids in a very carefully planned environment. It was not random. So all what you, what you hear, you should examine it. The first question you should ask is, is it a fact? And second question, question that you should ask, is it true? Let me give a simple example. Um, at least once in every three to four years, many of these new newspapers are in the habit of publishing a photograph. When the circulation declines, they would publish a photograph. Somebody, in um, he was going through Himalayas, 
and he found out a monkey with a human head or a human with a monkey head he shot that person and here is the photograph and you would see that photograph published the first photograph of the kind that i saw was that of a mermaid it was published in the hindi newspaper body of a fish and then from chest upwards the body of a female they have been publishing photographs like that since the days photography was invented and even before that it is just fiction it is myth so when somebody comes with the latest news the first question is it a fact number 2 is it an established fact of science and therefore the question of bible and science when it it is placed to you this is the angle that you have to take a few more points i would like to or a few more references i would like to bring to you from bible and science and one of the most interesting which i found is uh, found in job chapter 26 verse 7 job 26 7 he that means god hangs the earth upon nothing amazing the book of job was originally written about 4000 years ago 4000 years ago it was inconceivable for a person to believe that the earth is a globe which hangs upon nothing in fact all religions other than the christian faith all religions in this world have theories all ancient religions have theories about how the earth is supported by either a cobra or by atlas god atlas and whenever atlas has an itching in the body you get an earthquake here the bible makes no such statement it very clearly says that god hangs the earth upon nothing and that statement comes in the oldest book in the word of god the book of job was written even before the book of it was written 400 years before the book of genesis was written there are many more astronomical re- uh, references in the bible for example in jeremiah chapter 33 verse 22 it says that the host of heaven cannot be numbered you cannot number the stars up to a few centuries ago the scientific establishment was under the firm impression that stars can be numbered whereas 3000 years ago the word of god said the stars cannot be numbered today i was uh, just uh, reviewing some of the scientific data and it was amazing reading it once again light travels 3 lakh kilometers per second 3 lakh kilometers per second if you travel at that speed 3 lakh kilometers per second it would take you more than 4 years to reach the nearest star that seems like a lot of distance but please remember our milky way is so huge that to go from one end of our milky way to the other it would take 1 lakh years more than 1 lakh years at the speed of light 1 lakh 3 lakh kilometers per second and to go from the earth to the outermost known edge of the universe i say known because the more powerful the telescopes become the more you see to go to the outermost known edge if you travel at 3 lakh kilometers per second it would take you 5 billion years or more maybe by the time by this time it has that has increased to 10 billion and there are trillions upon trillions of stars in this cosmos they thought that we would be able to 
number them all the word of god says no they cannot be numbered wherever the word of god makes a statement related to the world of science it turns out to be accurate it turns out to anticipate science centuries or even millennia before science could discover it and therefore my friends when questions come related to bible and science there are few things that you have to remember when the finite man tries to understand communication from the infinite god difficulties are bound to arise we should not be surprised we should not at all be surprised i still remember the day i had my phd physics phd viva there were about 120 people in the audience my son was also there and they often tease me saying that they they never saw my face turning so red with embarrassment when some of my professors would ask a question for which i had no answer and they had given me strict instruction to explain everything in a language which everyone in the audience could understand i tried to make it as simple as possible but among 120 not more than 5 could grasp the essence of it and what is physics just one subject developed by us mortal men in a university audience among 120 people there were hardly 5 who could really understand the essence of what i said in spite of me making it so simple if as a branch of science can be so advanced that even people in the field of physics cannot understand each other obviously when god communicates with man there might be there would be there surely would be certain areas which we find difficult to understand more so because there are many areas in the spiritual life which are understood in a relational manner as you as your relation with god becomes more intimate you start understanding things which were a mystery to you till yesterday exactly the way we understand people and their motives when we grow in intimacy with them and therefore friends don't be dismayed if difficulties come up don't be embarrassed and also don't be terrified given enough time it can be demonstrated that this problem also is only a problem because you did not have all the data at hand once all the data came to you the problem is solved let me give an example around 1880 almost all the best theological seminaries were based in germany and the german theological scholars were very sure that another 50 years of research and they would be able to dismantle the whole bible fine they were also sure of one thing that moses could not have written the first five books of the bible because the art of writing was not known at the time of moses 3000 yeah that is 1500 bc 3500 years ago the art of writing was not known they were very sure they were certain and they said let's do some more research and we would be able to demonstrate that moses could not have written it then towards the close of last century they started discovering libraries they discovered the library of the group of people known as the hittites in bible and then they started discovering one library after another and one of the archaeologists of course a lot lot were involved they deciphered all the pictures that you you see on all these uh, egyptian monuments i am sure that the picture looks familiar to you it's an egyptian 
picture and when you look at these egyptian monuments you would see a lot of pictures many of them are writing they deciphered it and then they started seeing writing everywhere and please listen some of these pyramids on which they found out these copious writing they were produced 500 years before the time of moses some of them were produced 1000 years before the time of moses and they all these years maintained that the art of writing was not known at the time of moses and they found out that the art of writing was existing in egypt at least 1000 years before the time of moses probably it existed much before that but the monuments have perished then they also had maintained that the art of writing was not known anywhere in the world 3500 years ago or that is 1500 bc in the 1940s and after that they discovered a library today it is known as the ebla library and the tablets on which they found out the writings are known as ebla tablets they found out a massive library almost all the books had perished because they were on clay tablets some survived because there was a fire in the library and the fire cooked them and like brick they remained they discovered 20000 tablets and these 20000 tablets that survived were produced a thousand years before the time of moses and there were references in these books that the librarian at the instruction of the king the librarian had copied some of these from a library which was still a thousand years older than that which means the art of writing was known at least 2000 years before the time of moses so when somebody hastily comes and says hey you christian fellow do you still believe in the bible they demonstrated this they proved this they have shown this they have discovered this don't become disturbed gone are the times when there was so meager data that a christian could become disturbed there is so much data available today related to bible science history that it is simply not possible for a person to sift through the data there is so such an abundance let me give you an example 6 months ago a person who came to my website on bible and archaeology challenged me he said hey uh, you say that bible is a, a historically accurate book listen bible mentions a group of people known as the hittites and uh, hittites have not been discovered and therefore uh, all what you see in the bible about hittites is simply fake it's imagination and he also said do you accept the challenge to do research into that topic and write a paper on hittites proving that hittites were real i am very much interested in archaeology but bible and archaeology itself is such a vast subject that i had never studied hittites in deep in depth so i said oh yes i'll write a paper on hittites and then i went to the biblical archaeological society website and this and that and ordered all the back issues of the journals i also went to couple of uh, second hand uh, book stores on the net and went to books which were published in 1880 1890 because that was a time when they discovered the hittites within 3 months books started pouring in journals started pouring in on cds and then i had a problem just on the subjects of hittites alone there is such a vast collection of first hand data that it would take me 2 to 3 years just to read let alone write the paper just one subject the hittites in the bible and that also just the data which i was able to buy in the last 6 months it would take me at least 3 years to read that is exactly what i said if we were born sometimes in 1800 and 
perhaps there was a reason to fear intimidation when someone came and said there is no data to support the bible but anyone who lives in the third millennium should realize that now our problem is not lack of data or paucity of data our problem now is not only an abundance there is an over abundance of data i have devoted my life to apologetics defense of christian faith and let me tell you i am a workaholic i am married to books my wife also she can confirm she didn't come but she can confirm